throughout much of the last uh, several decades, and I, I believe it existed far, far beyond that, but um, one of the biggest disagreements that church and faith communities have had and had to wrestle through and had to struggle with has been centered around worship. Now, specifically, worship style. Uh, many times this focused on what kind of instrumentation would be used and what songs would be most appropriate for the people of God to sing and declaring their praise. These wars often stem from a desire to honor God. However, sometimes they miss the point. Worship, first and foremost, is not about us. It's not about whether the song is new or the song is old. It's not about whether it's played with a guitar or it's played with a piano. It's about God. It's about God. These wars, as I said, often stem from a desire to honor God. Fundamentally, worship, though, is about where our attention is focused, where our eyes are at, who really is receiving the glory in our life? See, worship wars didn't begin back in the 80s with a change of music style. It began much, much further in the past, in the world, before Adam and Eve were in the Garden of Eden. And Satan, Lucifer, the angel said, I want to be like God. Then that lie went from there to tempting Adam and Eve to say, you really can be like God. And we're going to look at two passages of scripture today, 15 and 16 of the book of Revelation, where there's one group of people in chapter 15 who at the end of their life, they're gathered around the throne and they're singing, great and marvelous are your works, O Lord, King of the ages, we give you praise. And then we're going to look at chapter 16, and it's going to be about a group of people on earth who will not open their mouth to declare praise, even amidst all the righteous, true, just judgments of God that come upon them. This is first and foremost a passage about worship. And the text is first and foremost, the text is first and foremost a, a book about worship. Whom will we serve? Would you stand with me, please, for the reading of the scripture? Revelation chapter 15. Then I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels who have seven plagues, which are the last, because in them the wrath of God is finished. Then I saw something like a sea of glass mixed with fire, and those who have overcome the beast in his image and the number of his name, standing on the sea of glass, having harps of God. And they sang the song of Moses, the slave of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, great and marvelous are your works, O Lord God, the Almighty. Righteous and true are your ways, King of the nations. Who will not fear, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy. Let me just read that phrase again. For you alone are holy. For all the nations will come and worship before you. For your righteous acts have been revealed. And after these things, I looked in the sanctuary of the tabernacle of testimony in heaven was opened. The seven angels who had the seven plagues came out of the sanctuary, clothed in linen, clean and bright, and girded around their chests with golden sashes. Then one of the four living creatures gave to the seven angels seven golden bowls full of the wrath of God who lives forever and ever. And the sanctuary was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power, and no one was able to enter the sanctuary until the seven plagues of the seven angels were finished. Revelation 16. And then I heard a loud voice from the sanctuary saying to the seven angels, go, pour out on the earth the seven bowls of the wrath of God. So the first angel went and poured out his bowl 
on the earth. And it became a loathsome and malignant sore on the people who have the mark of the beast and who worship his image. And the second angel poured out his bowl into the sea and it became blood like that of a dead man and every living thing in the sea died. Then the third angel poured out his bowl into the rivers and the springs of waters and they became blood. And I heard the angel of the water saying, righteous are you who was and who is, O holy one, because you judged these things for they poured out the blood of saints and prophets and you have given them blood to drink. They deserve it. And I heard the altar saying, yes, O Lord God, the almighty, true and righteous are your judgments. And the fourth angel poured out his bowl upon the sun and it was given to it to scorch men with fire. And the men were scorched with fierce heat and they blasphemed the name of God who has the authority over these plagues and they did not repent so as to give him glory. Then the fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast and his kingdom became darkened and they gnawed their tongues because of pain and they blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores and they did not repent of their deeds. And the sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river, the Euphrates and its water was dried up so that the way would be prepared for the kings from the east. Then I saw coming out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet, three unclean spirits spirits like frogs. For they are spirits of demons doing signs which go out into the kings of the whole world to gather them together for the war on the great day of God, the Almighty. Behold, I'm coming like a thief. Blessed is the one who stays awake and keeps his garments so that he will not walk about naked and men will not see his shame. And they gathered them together to the place which in Hebrew is called Har Megedon. Then the seventh angel poured out his bowl upon the air and a loud voice came out of the sanctuary from the throne saying, it is done. And there were flashes of lightning and sounds and peals of thunder. And there was a great earthquake such as there had not been since man came to be upon the earth. So great an earthquake was it and so mighty. And the great city was split into three parts and the cities of the nations fell. Babylon the great was remembered before God to give her the cup of the wine of the wrath of his rage. And every island fled away and the mountains were not found and huge hailstones about one talent each came down from heaven upon men and men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail because its plague was extremely severe. These are the words of the Lord. Father, we give you praise. Father, through the work of the Holy Spirit, would you help us understand your word today? Give us eyes to see, give us ears to hear, give us hearts to set upon its truth so that we might be the people who live awake lives of worship to our King. We bless you, Lord God. We pray in the name of Jesus. Together we say, amen. Please be seated. All right, so it's another tough passage. I feel like I've told you that many, many times because these are, these are just kind of heavy, heavy passages. But we're going to go ahead and look at these two things. Again, we're talking about worship. Revelation 15, we find that the throne room is what we're looking at. It says that in verse 1 of chapter 15. It says, um, I saw another sign in heaven. All right, so, so John is looking and he's, he's prophetically seeing this from the Isle of Patmos in Asia Minor. And he's looking at this and he's going, all right, this is what I'm being shown by God. He's in heaven and he's seeing the last of plagues. If you've been with us for a couple of weeks now, you know that we've studied the, um, the, first, um, the first set of plagues, the seal judgments. Then we looked at the trumpet judgments. Now we're gonna be looking at the final seven judgments. And these are the bowl judgments. Um, bowls are, let me see if I have a photo. Oh, not yet. That's not the photo I want. I'll tell you about bowls in just a minute. Um, when we talk about these judgments, these come in a series of three sets of seven. And what we've seen so far is that when we come to this first set, there's a pause in between the sixth and the seventh seal. When we came to the trumpet judgments, there was a pause or an interlude between the sixth and the seventh trumpet. We come to this one and we find out it's going to go all seven judgments right back to back 
one after another. And these are gonna be the most extreme judgments. These are seven plagues in verse one, which God says are the last. As we look at this though, um, I want you to notice what it says here. Um, The sign in heaven that he sees, he says it is great and marvelous. He's looking at what, of what is going to take place here. He's like, what, what sign here is great and marvelous? Seven angels who have seven plagues, which are the last. Why is this great and marvelous? It's because as we read, this is the finishing of the wrath of God poured out upon the earth. He has seen successively this Um, the seal judgments, the trumpet judgments, the bowl judgments. He's looking great and marvelous because God's wrath will be finished. God's wrath will be complete. God's wrath will be sufficient for everything that is needed here. I think that's one of the reasons why these he describes are great and marvelous. We're coming to the end of this. And the people that he's looking at are people the text describes as those who have overcome the beast and his image and the number of his name. And so we look at that and we, we look at where we've been These are saints who were alive during the tribulation, many of whom have lost their lives during the tribulation because they refused the mark of the beast and they've received the mark of their king. So these are people who've experienced incredible, incredible hardship for the name of Christ, who've lost their lives. We read this, I think it was in chapter 13, says that these are they who have come out of the great tribulation. They've washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb. They're not saved because they survived any part of the tribulation. They're saved because their hope was in Messiah, not their hope was in the kingdoms of this world. Their hope wasn't in what world could do for them. Their hope was in God has called us to this. God has redeemed us. Oh, we stand. Whatever happens in life or death, we stand with the hope of the gospel. We stand with that Christ is sufficient for us today. These overcomers, they they sing a song. And I love how many times Revelation says, and there was a song being sung. And actually they're given harps here. And what that harp looks like, I I don't know. Maybe it's an awesome looking guitar. It's got some strings on it. The the ancient harp is kind of a precursor to the guitar, actually. Um, It's a little bit different too. But, But they're gathered around and they're singing. And, and just think about this. These are people who have experienced the harsh reality of the people of this world, the rulers of this world, the, the adversary in this world, and what captures their heart? What captures their mind when we look at them in the text? They're gathered around. They're standing on a sea of glass, right? They're, they're standing on a sea of glass in heaven. They have harps of God. They're singing the song of Moses, This could be Exodus chapter 15, um, where where Moses has just led the people of Israel out of Egypt by by God's strong arm. And they come to the end of this and they sing this amazing song. It could also be Deuteronomy 32, where Moses then is again singing another song towards the end of his life. And he's, he's, he's proclaiming who God is, what God has done, and how God has been faithful in the midst of unsurmountable or in unfathomable um, types of experiences. These overcomers sing the song of Moses, the song of the lamb, songs that declare God's righteous deliverance of his people against their foes and God's foes. But notice this song has nothing to do with themselves. Great and marvelous, it says, are your works, O Lord the Almighty. Righteous and true are your ways, King of the nations. Who will not fear, O Lord, and glorify your name? You alone are holy, for all the nations will come and they will worship before you, for your righteous acts have been revealed. Every word in there is about what God has done. Every word in there, even the ones that saying like, who will, who will not fear you? Who will not glorify your name? They're saying, who could not lift up the name of Jesus when we've seen what he has done? When we see his righteous acts, when we see how God himself came to earth to step down into the sin and the muck and the mire to redeem people who are lost, 
Who could not fear him? Who could not glorify his name? These are saints who have experienced incredible, incredible loss, incredible persecution. And the words that are before the throne are not, God, I don't understand why. And they're not, um, God, why did I have to? They are righteous and true are your ways, king of the nations. It's challenging to me, because I don't know about you, it's more common for me to think about, ugh, I don't like this God. I don't understand this God. God, this is hard. These are people whose eyes are on the Lord. This last week, I read a story um, about a, a group of believers in Nigeria, this is a guy by the name of Pastor Andrew. He's a pastor in Nigeria. And a few years ago, Boko Haram, which is a, um, Islamic, a, a violent um, Islamic faction, um, came. And they, their mission, by the way, is to, to wipe out all presence of Christians in the area. But they came through Pastor Andrew's community one night. They sought to wipe out people, to kill and destroy what they could not steal because of their hatred of Christians, more specifically, because of their hatred of the God whom these Christians worshipped. Pastor Andrew's prayer, this article said during this time, was, was that um, God strengthened their faith. And his prayer was, and even if they are abducted, help them not deny Christ, but hold firmly to their faith. According to the ministry Open Doors, Nigerian Christians are among the most persecuted people in the world for the name and the cause of Christ. Pastor Andrew in the article said he never thought that they would rebuild and come back together to worship as a congregation. The fear, the uncertainty, the threats of violence. He wondered whether they could ever come back. Seven years after this ferocious attack, after fleeing for their safety, after quietly peeking out, seeing who was still alive and who was still there the next morning, the church began to gather again. Seven years later, they had um, reconstructed their worship center so that they could all gather and so that they could proclaim the name of the Lord Jesus in the midst of their of their loss, in the midst of their pain, in the midst of their struggle, so that they could gather as a church and they could read the word of God. They could gather as a church and they could sing. I read that story and I went, wow. Maybe that's kind of like what the saints during the tribulation will experience. After, after likely losing their life for the cause of Christ, which is why they're in heaven gathered around the throne at this point, after losing their life, what matters is not what happened here. All that matters is him. All that matters is him. I'm challenged by stories like this because I too often look at the things around me with questions and God can handle our questions. That's not a problem. But I often look at the things around me and the second thing I might do is worship, not the first. We see in this, this picture into the throne room of God, these people are absolutely consumed with the worship of God. The song focuses of God amidst the terror experienced by the saints in the tribulation. What, captor, what captures their attention is not what they did for God or what was done to them by the beast. They're focused on the Lamb. They're focused on the lamb. <sighs> Leads me to ask the question of myself. What is my response when I face hard times? Frankly, what's my response when I face good times? Because sometimes it's in the middle of um, blessing and prosperity that the world might look at as beneficial. It's many times in that that I go, oh, yeah, nice job there. And God wants her eyes to be taken off of the temporal things of the world and to be absolutely fixed on him. Why? Because he loves you. Because he knows what's best for you. Because he knows whether you're in a high point of your spiritual walk or you're in the lowest of points in your spiritual walk, he is still God. He is still sufficient to meet your needs. Think about it for a moment. Ask yourself the question, 
Where do I turn when I face hard times? Where do I turn when I face good times? When it talks about them singing about the righteous acts of God, it's the same word that's used in Romans chapter 5 when it says, um, therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness, talking about Jesus' death and his resurrection, leads to justification and life for all men. They're proclaiming over this, Jesus, you are Lord. Jesus, you are Savior. Jesus, you are our Redeemer. And their minds and their hearts are absolutely fixed on these things. They, they've experienced justification or vindication or, or acquittal for their sin because they have trusted in Christ. The end of chapter 15 sets up for us the, the contrasting description in chapter 16. Chapter 15, we've got these worshipers before the throne. Chapter 16, um, the, the end of 15 is kind of talking about the, the living creatures um, gave to the seven angels. Is verse 7, the seven golden bowls full of the wrath of God who lives forever. Um, there's smoke in the sanctuary of God up in heaven. Uh, and it's there until the plagues are finished. And verse 16 says, then I heard a loud voice. And the word loud here is the word mega in Greek. Can you say mega? Yeah. So like megaphone or something like that. This is actually by, by some scholars called the mega chapter in the scripture because I think it's nine times um, this word mega appears to heighten what is like already kind of strong. Um, but, but, but to just say, this isn't just a voice, this is a voice. And, and it'll go through here in, in several different ways. So this is the mega chapter. There's this mega voice from the sanctuary saying to the seven angels, go pour out on earth the seven bowls of the wrath of God. Here's kind of a, a kind of picture of where we're going forward. The seal judgments, trumpet judgments, we're in the bowl judgments. We're moving towards the second coming in a couple of chapters. Here's the kind of bowl. This is from the third slash fourth century before the time of of Christ. This is a golden libation bowl. What this bowl likely would have been that John's describing here is a shallow bowl with which they'd put something in that and then they'd bring it and they'd pour it on the altar. Um, so this is being filled. There's seven of these. There's seven angels. Each have one of these. And this is these are being poured out on the earth. And we'll just kind of work through this fairly quickly because the first angel goes out and he pours his bowl on the earth, okay? So this is what John is seeing. This is on the earth, meaning it's over the entire earth. This is affecting, it says here, um, it became a loathsome and malignant sore on the people who have the mark of the beast and who worship his image. This is directly aimed at people who have dug in their heels against God. These are not innocent people in the in the in the in the walk of life. These are people who have said, we will not worship you, Lord. We will set our hearts and our minds directly against you. And these judgments come out on the earth. I actually, I think that there's probably very few believers on earth at this time. As we look through this, this is just, just all consuming. And we saw with the seals, um, it affected a quarter of the earth. The trumpets um, affected a third of the earth. This affects all who live on the earth and who have this mark of the beast and who worship his image. So this first bull pours out and it's a, it's a loathsome, malignant sore. And the second bull pull, comes out and it refers to, um, it, it's poured specifically on the sea and it becomes like that of a dead man. Every living thing in the sea died. We get pictures, by the way, of what happens in the, um, in the exodus out of Egypt with the plagues that God sends upon Pharaoh and upon Egypt. We have kind of reminiscent things going on, but this has just taken that to a whole nother extreme. And so this, this photo is actually from a lake in Iran um, and what, the reason it's red is because of what's called the crimson tide, which I learned this week uh, has to do with a saline resistant algae and it turns the water red. Here we have, it, it, it just says, let me find it. It became blood like that of a dead man. And notice what happens as a result. Every living thing in the sea died. Just think about that. This could, this, this is a big deal for, for people who get food from the sea, for people who get water that goes up in, in all the like atmospheric things with it going up into the air and it comes down and rains. To, to have water that becomes like this becomes an absolute stench and an absolute um, 
challenge for living in this latter part of the tribulation. So that's what happens in this, with the second angel and the second bowl. The third angel poured out his bowl into the rivers and they become blood as well. But what I find interesting here in verses four through seven of chapter 16, as he's talking about this third angel, um, the third angel in verse five says, righteous are you who was and who is, or who is and who was, O holy one, because you judged these things, for they poured out the blood of saints and prophets, and you have given them blood to drink. It says they deserve it. He's equating, this is how the people of the world have treated your prophets, God. This is right. This is true. This is just. You see this kind of destruction, and one of the things we go, really, did it really have to come to that? And what it's saying here is God is righteous. God knows what is best. He knows what is exactly measure for measure against the people who are coming against his people and ultimately his name. And there's just, in, in this third one, there's just this reminder, God, you are almighty. You are true and righteous in all of your judgments. We come to the next one. Bowl four is given upon the sun and it has to do with fierce heat. This is an incredible photo um, I found this week of, of, of the sun and something coming out of the sun there. Um, intense heat. So something happens atmospherically and it's poured upon the sun and the result of this bowl of judgment is it scorches men with fire. They, they were scorched with mega heat. You could translate it there. It's the Greek word, mega. And they blasphemed the name of God who has the authority over all these plagues. And they did not repent so as to give him glory. So you come to this fourth one and you've got people who are experiencing incredible pain, like physical pain. And even in their physical pain, the text says they dig in their heels against God. They know that these are from God. They know these are for his righteous work being given to the people who are unrighteous. And they dig in their heels and they do not repent. In fact, they blaspheme his name. The, the idea of blaspheming here has to do with speaking slanderously, ruining a reputation of someone. Um, and they did not repent of their deeds. And the idea of repentance here has to do with a significant change of mind and as a result of life because of the consequences of sin. They, they experience these consequences of their sin and they still dig in. They still dig in. It's kind of like Pharaoh back in, back in Exodus where you get the first plague, the second plague, all, all the way through. Finally, he relents after the 10th plague. But even after the 10th plague, his, his heart hardens and he digs in against God. And this is talking about um, the people during this tribulation time on earth who dig in their heels against God. They dig in back into the lie that God, um, in, in other words, they dig into the lie that God is responsible for their unrighteous deeds. They, they, they don't take responsibility. They, they, they're they're kind of like a sibling who knows they've done wrong, but they're going to continue to blame someone else for their, for, their, um, for their actions. Not that I would know anything about that, being the middle child in a family. I never blamed my siblings for things that I did. Never. <laughs> Just kidding did all the time. Um, we come to the end of this fourth bowl. We're introduced to the fifth bowl and, and it takes us to the next level. It's poured out, notice, on the throne of the beast and his kingdom became darkened and they gnawed their tongues because of pain. Now, some scholars suggest, and I think they're right in this, that this kingdom of the beast is centered from the, from the city of Jerusalem, specifically from the Temple Mount. We find this in Daniel chapter 9. We find this in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, I think it is, where it talks about how the Antichrist, the false Messiah, goes in and he sets up his own kingdom and he sets it up in the place where the ab abomination of desolation occurs. And so there's a, there's a judgment that is poured out over this land and, and it results in darkness over the land and painful sores, right? They're experiencing this incredible challenge here. Um, 
during this time and they still again dig in their heels and they choose not to repent of their deeds. We're introduced then to a sixth bowl and this one has to do with um, judgment being poured out on the Euphrates River. Um, it says here in verse 12 that its water was dried up so that the way of so that the way would be prepared for the kings from the east. Um, one scholar writes it this way. He says, uh, here's, here's a photo by the way, of the Euphrates River. You can kind of follow that. Jerusalem is over here. One scholar writes, at its nearest point, the Euphrates River was 335 miles north of Jerusalem. For most of its distance, the Euphrates creates a long ribbon of life in a semi-arid region. You can see that, how dry it is. The darker is obviously the places that have more water. It forms a natural barrier to travel across the Mesopotamian River Valley. And this is the beginning of things that prepare the way for the great battle of Har Megedon, or you might know it as Armageddon. It, it, re, it, re, it re, uh, what's the word I want? Um, it refers, that's the word I want. It refers to that last and final battle of the tribulation period where, where Megiddo, and I've got a photo of Megiddo. Here's where it's at in, in terms of uh, where it's at in Israel. This is the plains of Megiddo. There's hills around it. The body of water on your left is the um, Mediterranean Sea. The body of water kind of in the center right is the Sea of Galilee. Th this is a place where if you wanted to come from north to south, you would have to cross through here most likely. Uh, you, you would have to come in through here. And many, many battles took place both in the Old Testament times and will take place here because it's just an easy place to have a battle. It's very strategic. You can amass troops here. And this is referring to the beginning of the great battle of Armageddon, the, the gathering for this. The Euphrates was the western border of the land that God gave to Israel. And, and this action um, seems to make it easier for opposing kings to come up into the land of Israel and to fight this notorious battle. Uh, one scholar puts it this way. I think I have, yeah, there we go. So you can kind of see the lay of the land. You've got Nazareth, Mount Tabor, Hill of Moreh, but you have this beautiful Jezreel Valley. You have the, the actual fortress of Megiddo and you have this plain where battle would take place. One scholar says, Megiddo was a strategically important city in antiquity because it controlled a key pass along the major highway from Egypt to Syria. Additionally, Megiddo is situated in the head of a broad flat plain, the Jezreel Valley. These factors made the area around Megiddo the site of several major battles in antiquity. And, and so you, you sense that as these judgments come out, the end is drawing near. It's coming, it's coming, it's coming, it's coming. It's moving towards this. And the sixth angel pours out on the Euphrates and we see all this stuff with the dragon and the beast and the false prophet. Some people call that the satanic trinity. And demons, um, the spirits of demons um, like frogs come out and they go to gather people throughout the world for the great battle, the great day of God, the almighty. And verse 15 is like a parenthesis in here. And he's just writing to the, the people who are reading this and he's saying, behold, I'm coming like a thief, which means you don't know know when I'm coming. But notice what he says, blessed is the one who stays awake and keeps his garments so that he will not walk around naked and men will not see his shame. What are they to do in hearing about all this coming? Be awake, be vigilant, engage meaningfully, intentionally with God in your spiritual life because the day is coming. We don't know when it is, but the day is coming when there will be this last battle. And you talk, it talks about this battle of Armageddon. We come to verse 17 and to the end. And in verse 17, it says, the seventh angel poured out his bowl upon the air. The loud voice came out from the sanctuary and it said, it is done. It is done. The, the way that this is written in the Greek stresses the fact that something has been done. It's been completed, but it has effects that linger into the future. The picture here in the next verses is one of incredible earth shattering, like, like you've got lightning and you've got an earthquake. It says a city is split. It's that nations fall, mountains crumble, islands flee, hailstones, 75 to 100 pound pieces of hail come from the sky and they come upon the earth. This is incredible. 
incredible stuff. Major geographical changes are occurring, which if you want to find a nice p- parallel passage, go check out Zechariah 14 a little bit later today. All of this is a battle over worship. All of it. it, it it's God in, in um, Revelation 15 giving us a picture of what are these tribulation saints doing? They're before the throne in heaven, having lost their lives on earth. They're giving glory to the one who gave them redemption and rescue through his son, Jesus. And on earth, it's all of these horrible plagues which are justly and righteously given to people who have said, God, we don't want redemption. In fact, we want to be God in in our life, we want to be God over the whole world. We want to worship the beast and align ourselves with him. In the end, the one who is truly God is the one who reigns. With the story of the Exodus, the people are living in a very religious society. The the children of Israel, when they live in Egypt, they're in a very religious society. There's a temple to everything and everyone all over the place. The thing they did not know was which God is actually real. I think we struggle with that today too. Because we worship the God of affluence. We worship the God of the job ladder. We worship the God of family. We worship the God of sexual sin. We worship the God of entertainment. We worship the God of good things and bad things. And the words of God are this. Choose this day whom you will serve. He says to Joshua. Joshua says this, for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. He could have served any lowercase g God in the world. And the one he chooses to serve is the one who is the real God. Revelation 15 and 16 point us to which is the real God. And we look at this and we look at the judgments that come and they should be weighty for us because these judgments come upon people who are made in God's image. In fact, Peter says it this way, the Lord is not slow in keeping his promise. He delays his return because he wants all to come to faith. But there's coming a day when in truth and in righteousness, he will come and he will judge the earth. How then shall we live? Friends, we have to remember there's only one God whom we serve. That's the Lord. And everything in our life must be placed under his amazing authority because he cares for you. He wants what's best for you and for me. He wants us to experience life and he knows the only way that we can experience life is in him. We can be conned and lied to that life can be experienced by the things of the earth. It can't. It can only be experienced by living dynamically in a relationship with him. He invites us to worship. That's basically what worship is. Finding a life in the one who gave his life for you. Declaring how good and how great God is, even amidst your circumstance. But he also calls us then to be a people who go out and say, you know, I've received life. Can I share life with you? You're wandering down this path. Maybe you're talking to a family member. Maybe you're talking to a friend. Maybe you're talking to a coworker. You're wandering down this path. It's not going to lead to life, but I know someone who can give you life. These two chapters have to do with worship. Where is our worship today? Stay awake. Be ready. Proclaim the message of Jesus because he's the only one that can save. Would you pray with me, please? Our Father and our King, as we get ready to move towards communion and we remember the body of Christ broken for us and the blood of Christ shed for us, God, would you help us to rightly orient the worship of our life? 
Thank you, Father, for forgiving us of our sins. Thank you that in your economy, if we are in Christ, we are a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. You do not look at us as people separated from you. But God, even in the moments where we choose to walk a different path, as your children, would you, by your spirit, reveal that to us, that we might come to you and experience life, experience the fullness of life in Jesus Christ. We thank you, God, that you have stepped down into this muck and this mire. Were it not for that, we would find ourselves also people righteously judged. But for all of us, God, who have placed our faith in Jesus' death and resurrection, I thank you that we no longer have to become slaves to fear or to worry, to anxiety, even though we struggle with those. We don't have to become slaves of that because we are your children. I thank you, God, that you meet us with everything we need today. I thank you, God, that you give us grace in our time of need. We love you and bless you in the name of Jesus. Amen.